I'd start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples, and I pay my respects to elders both past and present, and extend that respect to First Nations people with us here today. Uh, thank you to my wonderful colleagues, uh, Peter Murphy and Bridget Archer, there's Bridget there, um, as co-chairs of the Parliamentary Friends of Women's Health, and to the amazing uh, Breast Cancer Network Australia for hosting the event. I can't tell you how thrilled I am. Now, as many of you would know, my wonderful colleague, Peter, brings her own lived experience of the effects of metastatic breast cancer to support an incredible and inspirational advocacy to improve outcomes of the disease. And we are very, very proud of Peter. And if ever you um, wanted to meet or have us co-chairs two wonderful women who truly live their values, absolutely live their values on their sleeve, are committed to them and go out far and beyond to make sure that they represent their um, electorates in the true way that they know they can. It's these two wonderful women and um, they really are amazing. There's no doubt about it. So thank you for having me all that you do. I wrote that <laughs> But it is a rare thing to have values driven politicians in this day and age, and here's two wonderful women here today that do that. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge the tireless work of BCNA to ensure that all Australians affected by breast cancer receive the best support and care, especially for rural and regional Australians. And just in that very short time I had here before um, we kicked off this morning, the number of women that said to me the support they get from BCNA is beyond compare and I couldn't have done it without them. So thank you so much. Uh, because you do um, provide support that is so important. It creates um, connections between people and families going through very similar situations. Creating communities of care is a beautiful thing to be able to do. You connect people to treatment, you support them every single step of the way. Now we see flashes, every time we see flashes of pink, Peter isn't wearing pink today, <laughs> we'll forgive her just this once. Um, we see, every time we see flashes of pink, uh, we're reminded of the importance of this cause and the efforts of BCNA to raise critical funds. From Pink Sports Day to Pink Lady events and everything in between, uh, it is a tireless organisation. Yesterday, many of you took part in the National Roundtable, I understand, focusing on improving data for metastatic breast cancer. And I believe it was a very rich and fabulous conversation. Um, it's startling, isn't it, that um, as revealed in the BCNA's report in October last year, uh, with the app title, Hidden in Plain Sight, that reporting through our cancer registries is inconsistent and missing vital information. In this day and age, it's really hard to believe. There's no data on stage of cancer at diagnosis or cancers that recur or those that spread through the body. And this is something that must be addressed. It's interesting to know, and I, didn't, I was remiss, I didn't acknowledge all my wonderful parliamentary colleagues that are here this morning. And there's quite a number of you, and I know if I start mentioning names, I'll miss someone, but they are all here. But even in, the, um, in this room amongst my colleagues, there are two women who um, have experienced breast cancer and are survivors. Um, it is hidden, we don't know. Data is absolutely vital. It has to be addressed. <coughs> Excuse me. So thank you for raising this very important um, missing bit of the puzzle yesterday. Um, and the good news is that you had very good outcomes, I understand, from that round table. Uh, and I I'm very pleased to tell you, and I probably will have to shoot you all after I've done this because the cancer plan hasn't been released, but I can tell you that it will identify better data as a very early priority for action. Cancer Australia will drive improvements in cancer data collection and sharing in close consultation with state and territory governments and other key stakeholders such as you. Better data will steer us towards better and more equitable screening, treatment and outcomes for those living with cancer. If we want to beat cancer, we've got to understand it better. And data is the critical tool that will assist in addressing all the variations in cancer outcomes in Australia. Now, there are also exciting developments in the genomic space, which I'm pleased to share with you. Genomics, 
kind of still a bit of a magic word to me, genomics, but it is an evolving area and we are learning more and more about it every day. And it's having a really amazing impact on treating cancer. From November 1, the government was subsidised through Medicare, the gene expression profiling test, known as EndoPredict, which rates a patient's risk of breast cancer recurring. And this will be a fantastic development. While it's early days, the potential is immense and more breast cancers caught early will mean more patients are successfully treated. The earlier we can intervene, the better the outcomes are, and you all know that. After all, at the heart of this work are people, families and communities whose lives it touches. For people living with cancer, especially when it's metastatic, these measures will provide significant support because we know that living with cancer doesn't just impact you physically, it has a huge impact on your mental and emotional well-being, and not just the patients. Of course, it's on the families and the carers. BCNA and all of you here today, especially you brave people with metastatic breast cancer, deserve congratulations for your ongoing efforts to raise awareness of the disease. The work you do to increase community understanding of risk factors to highlight the importance of knowing your family history, for example, and to support the Australian community to be breast cancer aware is nothing short of remarkable. Today and yesterday's roundtable is another example of the incredible work that the BCNA and all of you are doing to save lives. And I can assure you that alongside the Minister for Health and Aged Care, who sends his warm regards today, the wonderful Mark Butler, we are absolutely committed to this cause with you. With your help, we're working to make the health system better, particularly for people affected by cancer and breast cancer. We can't do it without you. Please keep up your energy. Please keep up your good work because we need each and every one of you if we are going to beat this terrible disease. Thank you so much for having me this morning. Thank you so much, Jed. That was um, just so welcoming. And I think, you know, it really sets the scene for today. I would like to, firstly, um, I want to acknowledge those people that are also joining us live online. Um, and my colleague Sam has just reminded me to remind people online if they can just please um, mute their audio. It's just helpful if they're hearing some feedback today. But I would like to acknowledge um, those of you joining us today. And we're going to talk about this very interesting but complex issue, and uh, Jed touched on it before, but before we get started, I would like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people who are the traditional custodians in Canberra and pay my respect <coughs> to their elders past, present and emerging, and I extend, I extend this respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. My name is Vicky Durston, I'm Director of Policy, Advocacy and Support Services at Breast Cancer Network Australia, but I'll also be a facilitator today. So welcome. I'd also like to acknowledge our parliamentary friends of women, uh, Women's Health, Peter Murphy and Bridget Archer, who are hosting today's event. So thank you so much. It means a lot. Um, and also to our CEO, Kirsten Pilati from BCNA and also our board chair, Catherine Fagg. We've got board members. And also a number of consumer representatives in this room with a lived experience of metastatic. And also those of you that are joining us from around the country that are, are visiting us to he here in Canberra and also online with Metastatic. We also have a number of government officials and researchers and a number of you who joined us yesterday as we started to tackle this very issue around metastatic breast cancer. Um, making metastatic breast cancer count. This topic is triggering and I am mindful that it, it is a triggering topic today. So want to acknowledge that to those of you in the room who are living with metastatic breast cancer, <laughs> but also want to take us back a little bit around the fact that BCNA is in its 25 year um, anniversary, if you call it that. And I know KP, you spoke about this yesterday. We're back here in Parliament House where it first started in 1998, where the silhouettes were planted outside of Parliament House. And yet 25 years on, we're still talking about the lack of consistent national collection and collating of metastatic breast cancer data. So this time, 12 months ago, the team and I sat in a room with Andrea Smith, one of our consumer reps, and a number of our, um, those living with metastatic breast cancer to look, what, look at what our strategic priorities would be for the next 12 months. And what became very apparent in that discussion is that we didn't actually know the number. We actually didn't know how many people are living with 
metastatic breast cancer. We thought it might be a couple of thousand, but we actually didn't know. And so with Sally Lord, who's here today, and other colleagues, we set about the, uh, the task of trying to use some modelling to estimate what that could look like. And what we did was we came up with an estimation of over 10,500 people living with metastatic breast cancer in this country in 2020. But we actually didn't know. And we knew that that was an underestimation and it, in fact, could be even up to 20,000. And that had us quite concerned because if we don't know, how can we possibly continue to work with you know, government officials, researchers, policymakers to inform change for this cohort. And we know that this is not unique to breast cancer. We know that this is problematic across the board. So yesterday we brought about a national round table and brought together over 40 key experts of researchers, government officials. I know Jason Poles in the room today. We also have Cindy Toms and, and Ariane from the department. But really brought about a discussion that talked about what are some of these challenges? But what are some of those short-term and long-term uh, solutions and areas in which we can all agree we need to come together and work towards? And I think, Jed, you've made a really good point that the Australia Cancer Plan, which is about to be launched, is really focused on harnessing that uh, data ecosystem and we need to do better. Um, it is not good enough to say that uh, the systems that we have in place now are meeting the needs of people with metastatic and advanced cancer. So in preparation, I reflected as a nurse for over 30 years caring for people with cancer with my nursing and medical colleagues, the faces and names that stay with you, and you'll see that on the screen today, is that data is, is about the people and it represents the people. And certainly through their advocacy of people that I've worked with over the years, whether that's big or small, the one thing that they all have in common is that they want their legacy, and I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about this um, soon, is they want their legacy to mean something. They want to be heard, they want to be seen, but they also want to be counted. Because if they're counted, that means that we can start improving the health outcomes for this group of people. So in that, with that in mind, it's now my absolute pleasure to welcome our three panellists this morning, who are going to share their stories and talk to you about why this issue is so very important. So bear with me, I'm going to be reading out their bios, I'm going to keep it, keep it short, but I think it's really important to, to understand who they are and what they bring to today's event. So firstly, I'd like to welcome uh, Peter Murphy, uh, who's a Member of Parliament. Peter was elected to the House of Representatives for Dudley, Victoria in 2019 and re-elected in 2022. Peter was first diagnosed with early breast cancer in 2011 at the age of 37. And in 2019, just days after being sworn into Parliament, she was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer. Since her maiden speech, Peter has worked to promote better treatment and understanding of breast cancer. As mentioned, Peter leads with co-chair Bridget Archer, the Parliamentary Friends of Women's Health, to provide a bipartisan platform with which to progress women's health issues. We thank Peter for her unwavering support and her courage in sharing her experience in metastatic breast cancer today. And I'd like to also welcome Professor Sanchia Aranda, a nurse by background. Sanchia has worked in control for over 40 years, most recently as CEO of Cancer Council Australia until 2020. She has held roles in healthcare, government and tertiary education and across the spectrum from prevention through to treatment and palliative care. She's a passionate advocate to improve health equity. Sancha has recently been appointed as board chair for the, for the Victorian Comprehensive Cancer Centre in Victoria. And Sancha facilitated yesterday's National Roundtable and will be sharing some of her reflections on the day shortly. And finally, I'd like to welcome Lisa Tobin. Lisa is a trained BCNA consumer representative and member of the BCNA Metastatic Breast Cancer Lived Experience Group. Lisa was first diagnosed with breast cancer in 2000, and in 2012, after experiencing symptoms of pain in her sternum and many months of investigation, she was diagnosed with a recurrence, metastatic breast cancer that had metastasized to her bones. Lisa is a dedicated advocate to improve outcomes for those living with metastatic breast cancer, and we thank Lisa for joining us today. 
So firstly, I'd like to get started, and, and Peter, I wanted to start with you, <coughs> just to be able to tell us a little bit about your own experience in relation to what does visibility for metastatic mean for you, and how you can share that with others. Thank you. Is this you? Oh, it's working. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I wasn't listening to you. Right. <laughs> um, thank you. Can I just start by saying for all the women in the room who either are living with breast cancer or have had breast cancer, yes, you're right, the temperature in here is all over the shop. It's not you. It's this building and this place. Um, so sorry about that. Uh, so I, I made the decision after I was elected, and as you said, in you know, typical example of Murphy's Law, got diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer shortly thereafter, before I gave my first speech, in fact, um, that I was going to be open about having cancer, partly because my face, as my mother's been telling me since I was about eight years old, reflects every thought that goes through my head, um, so I couldn't keep it secret, um, and partly because it's part of your life, my life experience and I'm in a pretty unique situation compared to um, most other women with um, cancer in terms of being able to raise visibility. Um, it, it's only recently that a number of people, I think, have tweaked that it's metastatic. It's not that I hit it, um, but there is something about metastatic or saying that you've got stage four cancer that is more challenging than simply saying that you have cancer um, because people think that you might be about to die tomorrow. Um, but I've, people know that I've got more state. Anyway, so my reflection about my job and visibility is, um, and I don't think this is not anything special about me, it's just simply that I have publicly said I have cancer and more recently people have been surprised I still have it when my hair fell out and they're like, oh, I thought you were over it. Um, <laughs> is that many, many women and many men come up to me and share their story with me because I have cancer and I'm someone in my community with a high profile. Um, and it's not just a breast cancer story, it often is, um, but it's often a story about different cancers and what they went through and how they're feeling. And I can see for them that that is valuable to other people to be able to see someone with high profile working with cancer, who they feel will understand what they've gone through or will care about what they've gone through. Yeah. Um, even if, and they're not necessarily telling me so I can change something about the system. They're just telling me because I am someone who they see as being receptive to their experience. Just for this room, occasionally I wish they wouldn't tell me about their lovely wife who died of breast cancer. Um, <laughs> But then when every time I think that, I think, well, actually, no, that's quite selfish of me because it's probably one of the few people they feel that they can come up and talk to about their wonderful wife who died of breast cancer and how much they love them and say to me, good on you, keep going. So that's a bit, I hope that makes sense. Yeah. And that's where I think visibility is really important. And that whole, if you're not visible and you're not talked about, then is your experience counted? I feel like people feel like their experience is a bit more counted. Thanks, Peter. And I might um, throw to you, Lisa, and we, we might explore a similar, a similar question really about, you've been living with metastatic now for 11 years. Can you explain what that means for you? And, um, and the visibility, why is it so important? Thank you, Vicky. Um, I think visibility is so important because if we're invisible, how can we be counted? Do we really matter? And us becoming more visible means that we are valued. Um, not to the uh, lengths that Peter has, but people come up to me when they know, because I'm 11 years in, and they want to share with someone that understands them. And I think that's so rare. And I think with more visibility, more people will be out there, 10,000, 20,000, whatever it is. And I want better understanding in the general community because people never understand that we never finish treatment, that um, when we talk about the war and early breast cancer and beating it, that doesn't apply to us. And I know a lot of metastatic ladies don't like that because our war won't finish and there is no finish line. So I really want everyone more, to be more aware 
of what we go through. Thanks, Lisa. And I think you both mentioned and spoke earlier in the week about how you, how the sea of pink often impacts you and, and you talk about the fact that when we talk about surviving and, and survivorship and the sea of pink, it often is not uh, reflective in how you're feeling as someone living with metastatic breast cancer. Can you elaborate a little bit on what that means? Yeah, definitely metastatic, some metastatic people, men and women, um, struggle, especially in October. They get lost in the sea of pink. Um, let's just call it the darker shade of pink that we're in. Um, and we're really thankful that there is an international metastatic day within October, but I think we need more. We need to be acknowledged that this is, the, it's not that we're more important, but this means that it is a terminal disease. We are treatable, but we are not curable. Why is collecting and reporting this data so incredibly complex? Thanks, Vicky. I, I think, so yesterday was a fantastic day to bring a lot of perspectives together, but I think the most important part of it is the gathering of momentum for change. Um, and if you think about cancer registries, they were established to count cancer. That's all they were established to do. And they were linked up with, with death registries to look at how we were doing. Um, and Australia has remarkable cancer outcomes. It is um, of the like jurisdictions that are in the International Cancer Benchmarking, we perform best in the world um, for cancer outcomes. But the problem is that that's inequitably experienced. Um, and so, Cancer itself is complex. It's been changing dramatically um, over the years. And so the amount of information that you need to understand uh, particularly survival and mortality has changed. And the systems haven't kept up. And I think that one of the key messages um, from yesterday is that Australia is falling behind on this space. And there are a number of reasons for that. So the first would be that in this country, cancer data or health data generally is seen as a risk to be managed rather than an asset to be leveraged. And that um, that, that perce perception means that data custodians become kind of concrete brick walls that you can't get through to get the data to be able to understand the performance of the system. And that is no more um, illustrated than through uh, our National Living Treasure, Professor David Rona, who's been a, a pioneering epidemiologist in this country for years. It took him three years to get access to a National Link data set to look at Aboriginal outcomes for an NHMRC grant funded by government, right? So that, it's insane that that takes um, that long. It also means that those data linkages are performed separately for every individual research project. So we have this delay inherently built into the system rather than establishing enduring linkages that are updated every year that um, uh, have access. And we've got some terrific examples in New South Wales, for example, where that linked data set is perpetual and researchers are accredited to use it rather than every project be accredited. And so that, that capacity can change. The other part of our complexity in Australia is we are a federated system and we have no national approach to that, which I hope will change with the um, draft cancer plan certainly um, emphasises this. But we heard yesterday from Jason Pohl, who's at the back there, about how that's different in a place like Canada where they overcome the provincial or state-based systems to develop at least a harmonised approach to collection and use of data so that it is more um, accessible. So that um, is really important. And, but that, what we see happening now is workarounds. So we've got lots of fragmentation. We've got data collections being built up in universities and in cooperative trials groups and in, um, in, in different spaces rather than really seeing those managed at a state level in a harmonised national approach that, that lets us leverage that. And I, and I think that the... The critical message out of that is that we have the capacity, the knowledge and the, the tools to improve cancer outcomes today, but we have no capacity to systematically apply that knowledge into the gaps where we know it exists. Um, so, for, so for example, um, in, in 
the work that we that was done in New South Wales while I was at the Cancer Institute on looking at um, outcomes because they do have stage registry derived stage data for over 40 years. What we saw in that data when you actually start to adjust the stage of diagnosis is that even and even with those adjustments and adjustment for socioeconomic status and, and for type of cancer, you see the gap between the haves and the have-nots widening over time, not closing. And so if we can't look at how our system is performing, what are the delays in diagnosis? Is that a primary care issue? Is it, is it a patient awareness issue? Mm. We, we can't actually change things. And as Fran Boyle said yesterday, we actually can't measure whether the investment we're making in drugs for early breast cancer reduces recurrence, reduces the number of women who ultimately develop metastatic disease. And so we, we are not empowered as clinicians and as a health system to make the changes that are needed. And so without that, without that understanding, we just don't know how to close the gaps. And that, I think equity is probably the, the most important rationale for changing the system. Thanks, Sandra. And Peter, I might come to you on that topic. And, and from your perspective, if we think about the appetite for change and what we saw yesterday, from a political position, how do you think we build that momentum in, in the role that you, that you play in this? I feel like you don't need my advice about building the momentum for change at the Breast Cancer Network. Um, <laughs> oh, look, to be honest, you know, politics is often about numbers. Um, and most people, when I said to them, we have this report that says we don't know how many people have metastatic breast cancer, I'm one of them. Um, it could be 10,000, 12,000, 20,000 women and some men in Australia simply looked at me and said, what? Are you serious? Mm. Um, and when you can say that, but also translate that and say, and here's one of them, and here's another one of them, and here's another one of them, and then layer it with, with what you just said about equity, that's the political momentum, right? It's yeah. about real people, and it's also about vulnerable people and inequality. And if you can't get politicians, and sorry, Jed, if you can't get the current progressive government to care about real people and equity, then I'd be shocked. Um, so that's what I think the political momentum comes from. Yeah. Um, and I think Bridget would agree with me, any government, any member of parliament is moved by knowing that one person is living with something that is difficult, let alone an unknown significant number of people, and that we could do something about it right now if we just had the will to do it. I'm just going to come to you, Lisa, around um, your perspective of what is it like for someone living with metastatic? Why, why is it so important that this data um, is visible? But then what, how does that translate into every day for someone living with metastatic breast cancer? If we were more visible, I think our services would be better. Um, also, with that data, they could identify locations, um, for staff placement, for specialty training, um, that we would have better access to psychosocial services. And I think that is a really big thing in that we're living with this constantly. It's not going to go away. We're living longer, thank goodness. So we need more of those services for a lot longer. In early breast cancer, you tend to have a period of time and normally you would be out of the system within about two years and then you go to your annual tests. But our tests never end, our treatment never ends, and we need those services. And as I said, because we live longer in some cases, we need that for a lot longer period. I'm sorry, can I say one more thing? I just, I find it, I, I find it really hard to accept that what I'm going through, I'm getting treatment and support that is so much better than many other women in Australia, to be mm. honest. Like, that's a really difficult thing, I think, to know and to own. So that that equity point and that, you know, knowing what support services are, 
um, I just can't emphasise how important that is because it's not right that I'm getting first class treatment because of who I am and my socioeconomic status and all the rest of it. Mm. And a woman in rural Australia or an Aboriginal woman just isn't, but we don't have the data to support that. Sorry, I know it wasn't much. No, absolutely, go for it. Can I just build on that a little? Because I, I think Please one do. of the key messages that came out of yesterday was that data isn't abstract. It is, every data point has a person at the end of it. It is about the people. And at the moment, our cancer system models of care are built around diagnosis and getting people into treatment. They're not built around ongoing systems of care. And we probably keep... Um, women with early breast cancer in the system too long and could free up resources by you know, actually implementing the national shared care model for follow-up of early breast cancer. Um, we could learn from that for other cancers and how we do it. And then we could really think about testing the kinds of support systems we need for women with metastatic disease and, and other people with metastatic disease. But we have no capacity to do that at the moment. And I... That is also part of the value proposition because we're, we're wasting an awful lot of resources in our acute system now that could be diverted to where they're better utilised and, and, and really think about equity in that way as well. But the other thing I wanted to touch on, um, Sanchi, was yesterday we talked about, although BCNA brought together uh, the National Roundtable and bringing those experts together, but this also goes way beyond breast cancer. Can you touch on that? Like why is this so important beyond just breast cancer? Yeah. So, so over the last um, 40 years, I've probably <coughs> had lots of people say to me, oh, why is all that money going to breast cancer? But actually... <laughs> we're just so lucky. Um, but I, you know, breast cancer has been the leader, and a lot of that has been because of the advocacy of women who are affected. Um, and I remember in the US there was a, um, a Me Too movement from prostate cancer, which is not like a you know, um, kind of learning, but actually the, the capacity for women to mobilise around this has been important. But everything that's happened in breast cancer has actually had impacts more widely in the system. We've it's a fantastic opportunity to test in a very complex disease new ways of thinking that then can be adopted more widely. So certainly the conversation we had yesterday about collecting stage and recurrence data in particular has implications much more widely um, for other cancers. But actually beyond cancer, we had a great conversation with some of the consumer representatives last night about the learnings around the, the silence or the invisibility for um, motor neurone disease, for cystic fibrosis, for a whole lot of other conditions that are life-limiting but chronic, that we people live in silence. And so we just need our system to be redesigned to take that into account, assuming that we think it is actually a system, because, of course, it's not really. Yeah. And just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you on the spot here a little bit. Just yesterday... One of the really impactful moments we had at the end of the day was you actually went round the room and asked every participant to acknowledge what was it that they wanted to see change, but also what their, their personal commitment or the commitment that they would bring to the table. And you were able to summarise it because it was very impactful. What were some of those commitments that, that people really shared that, was, that meant something? Yeah, so, so I think it, it ranged, so the commitments were really interesting and um, given that we're in this building, they were not all about government needs to do more. They were, um, there certainly was um, some of that that came out through the day in terms of um, mechanisms and resourcing. But it was about, I will commit to go and do this analysis with the data I already have. Um, I'll commit to keep this conversation going with um, within my organisation about how how that works um, more effectively. Uh, people, a lot of the commitments actually link to this idea of we have to create the value proposition for government but because we're very poor at articulating why this is important. Mm. And so um, that, that really came out of yesterday as well. And it, it was particularly important to hear from the Australian Association of Cancer Registries members. Um, so this is, this is a group that run the cancer registries 
um, who are intersecting with the health system all the time around um, data that are trying desperately to keep up with the modernisation um, of electronic data and, and data systems and, and reinventing. But they have very poor voice and are very poorly supported to collaborate. And they all, what, what, what they learned yesterday in the room was that lots of them are doing really innovative things, but there's not a mechanism for them to share and leverage and harmonise off that. And so that commitment to start to learn from each other mm. and to, um, if you like, leapfrog the learnings um, was, was quite profound, I think. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Lisa, I wanted to ask you your role of being a consumer representative on our Seat at the Table program and working with other people that have a lived experience of metastatic breast cancer. What does that mean for you? Well, firstly, I'm absolutely honoured to be participating in this. And with the lived experience group, the joint voices of us, I think, is so powerful. And as an individual, it's hard to make a difference, but the power of our joint voices will lead us forward, I'm sure. And to this point from the day the paper was released, it's, it's just been amazing. And to be able to share all of this with other ladies that, uh, and men who are going through it has been an amazing experience. And yesterday when everyone gave their commitments at the meeting, I just thought that was wonderful and that people were so passionate and I was so thankful that people yesterday took it on board to go ahead and make a difference individually. Thanks, Lisa. Peter, last words? I just wanted to uh, ask you, um, reflecting on today, this topic, we're working to build more awareness across community around the, the importance of understanding metastatic breast cancer. I just wanted to leave last comments to you. Um, every time I participate in a forum like this one, I'm just struck again by the strength and the courage of the women and some of the men um, <laughs> with lived experience who haven't just gone through something and said, okay, that's great, it's over, I'm going to get on with my life, or aren't just going through something and saying I'm just going to focus on myself, but are giving a huge chunk of themselves to try to make that same experience better for other people. Um, you know, it's my job, um, but for most people in this room, it's not your job. And the fact that people do this, and that Lisa does it, like, it almost makes me cry every single time. Mm -hmm. um, and it's that power of people saying, I want the next person's experience to be just that much better than mine, that I know is going to make a difference. So, I mean, don't get me wrong, I am so pissed off that I have metastatic breast cancer <laughs> um, and would do anything to have not had it. But there's, when I'm in these sorts of rooms, there's a part of me that thinks that it's an amazing opportunity that I've been given by having it, to be part of this sort of community, but also to play a small role in what all of you are going to achieve. So, never ever for a second think that anything that you're doing, even if it takes 25 years to get the result, isn't making a difference. Thank you so much. I think we can all agree that uh, the time is now for change and we certainly want a commitment from government and policy makers to prioritise this, this issue, to ensure that there's increased strength visibility of metastatic breast cancer and it is top of mind. Please join me in thanking Lisa Tobin, Professor Satcher Aranda and Peter Murphy. <laughs> also acknowledging Bridget Archer, thank you so much for your support and Jeff Carney for today. Um, it's certainly been an absolute honour to be here on behalf of BCNA and to all the team and certainly Lauren uh, Peter Murphy's uh, advisor and Anne who's here today. Thank you Anne for joining us. Um, it just these things don't come together without all the hard work from the team behind the scenes. So thank you so much. And um, to all of you online, thank you for joining us and um, thanks so much. <laughs>